Wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming to today's session. Um, my name is Trifany Hammond. I'm a support and resistance trader. Um, apparently, today I'm having problems with my words. Uh, forgive me if I do have to mute from time to time. I'm still, um, I still have this stupid cough. Um, but mainly what I do is I like to take larger time frames and um, put price action into kind of a larger context and then drill down, I call it, into the time frame that I like to trade, which is um, a one-hour time frame for entries and exits. So I do my analysis on a daily and a four-hour chart and look for prime exits on a shorter-term time frame. Now, I use daily, four-hour, one-hour, but you can use this on any um, combination of, of time frames that you like. So if you're a five-minute trader, you can do 30-minute, 15-minute, five-minute, um, or any combination therein. So um, I'm mixing it up a little bit today. For those of you who come regularly, you see me generally do the pound dollar. That wasn't ever my intention to just constantly do the same pair, but things um, it, there was kind of some, some repetition in, in um, the concepts that we've been talking about for weeks and weeks and we kept coming back to it. But I want to kind of shift gears a little bit today. Sorry about that. Um, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit today and talk about... Um, a different pair, a different context, we can actually take the same context to the pound dollar. It's doing something very similar on a four-hour chart. But um, because I'm a support and resistance trader, patterns come up quite a lot. Um, I, don't, I don't worry too much about trying to impress upon um, all of you who are so kind to come and spend your time with me, exactly what each little candlestick is called and trying to memorize a whole bunch of patterns and, and where they work and where they don't work. What I rather what I, I like to do instead is talk about really identifying sentiment inside the pattern. And that's what I want to talk to, to you today. Huh. That's what I want to talk to you today um, using the, the Looney Yen as an example. Um, we, I talk every week about what happens when currencies in particular begin to consolidate. Those of you who have come to the currency market from the, um, the, the equities, you know, whether that's commodities, futures, stocks, options, um, you've, you're going to very quickly realize that currencies behave very, di very differently than um, your, your typical uh, chart. Um, what we usually get very soon in the consolidation is a tightening up of price action. And I've talked about this a lot um, over the course of the last several months because it happens a lot. It's just what happens. In equities, people can channel trade quite easily. Well, they'll go, you know, from resistance to support, look for a bounce off of support, all the way back up to resistance. And they can do that again and again before things really begin to tighten up. In currencies, however, the tightening up happens very, very quickly. What we have here is um, on the Looney Yen daily chart, and I think we're we're going very long term. Um, we had a potential situation to have what it, most people know as, as a double top, right? Where price action has come up and rejected a price point or a price zone um, pretty distinctively. And it's generally a, um, not generally, it's always a reversal pattern. So what you want to see when you see something like that come up is you want to see you want to see it happen coming into it from an uptrend. You don't want to have it come up and hit that same resistance level going sideways um, because it just has a whole different um, context in terms of, of uh, sentiment. So what the Looney Yen had here was a potential for a complete reversal of this uptrend here. What it did instead, you can see here how this, this um, Support and resistance, and you know, it's a price point right now. Really, we're talking about a zone, aren't we? Right? Something like this. Instead, it came down, kissed that point, kissed that area, and then just completely rejected it. So first and foremost, what we need to recognize, before we even start talking about the tightening up that comes after it, we need to recognize that the, the absolute sentiment of price reversal, trend reversal, has been rejected, right? And that's kind of a, a big clue. You see these big shadows or long wicks. That's kind of a clue that something else might be going on. Uh, sorry about that. I hope I mute it in time. I'm always worried that I don't mute in time and I cough in your ears. Um, so what is that something else? Now we start to watch for, now that we've had rejection of this support zone in here, sharp rejection, right? Um, yeah, the sound cuts because I have to mute myself to um, to cough. Um, 
what we get with this, this price rejection here is really ultimately a lower or a higher low, I'm sorry, right? So now we start to look at this a little bit differently. We expect then the next thing to happen is a lower high. And this is that triangulation, that tightening up that begins to happen within price patterns on currencies so much more quickly than it happens in any other market that I've traded. And what we get to do at that point then is put on um, some trend lines that give us an idea of the pattern that is potential, that could be, that holds the potential to um, be the price pattern that is respected by the currency. Now, generally speaking, triangles, especially on daily and four hour charts, are considered continuation pattern. Um, really, instead of, you know, that, that push and pull that we get during a trend, what generally happens is if there's not enough oomph to bring price all the way back to old price patterns, things will consolidate long enough to come over and hit those trend lines. And that's that triangulation. And it's almost like um, resetting the game. It's just as good as a pullback. It just happens over a longer period of time and requires a different style of trading. So now we know that on the longer term chart, that's likely, but does it have to be a continuation pattern, especially after a double top? So what we start to look at then is what's going on inside of that consolidation. I know I'm spending a lot of time on the daily chart, but it's important to, to really impress on you the, what's, how to read price action, how to read sentiment. What we have here at the base of this triangle, look at all of these extremely um, convicted, with lots of conviction in these bullish movements, with a little bit of tiring out as it hit this old resistance, right? You can see all of these um, undecided little candles. You can see the difference here. If you really start to think in terms of sentiment behind the price action, the difference between action with conviction and action with um, confusion, right? Yes, the bulls were still buying. That price was still gradually going up. But you can see here how it lost some of its momentum, how the market lost some of its enthusiasm for the buy side of the trade. But generally speaking, the buy side of this triangle had a lot of conviction to it. If we look at the sell side of this triangle, um, anybody who's ever been a buy and hold type investor in any kind of um, stocks, commodities, anything in the equities market, you know that um, <laughs> the downside goes so much quicker than the upside. Of course, um, you know, in currencies, that's not necessarily the case because you're, you know, it's one value of a currency against another, not just one value of one particular um, commodity that you're trying to, to make money off of. But even still, after such conviction, having this go upward, you would think that the correction coming downward would have a lot of conviction as well. And instead, it did a push and a pull, a nice steady little downtrend. It didn't have the weight that this had on the upside. But look what happened here on the reversal. Lots of enthusiasm again, all the way to the top. We got a pull back to old price pattern here. And depending on how you would have drawn your trend line, right, imagine, hmm, if you had, didn't have this second, you know, this third low here, right, where your, your price might have been. I think mine was like right kind of in the middle of these wicks based on the four-hour chart. Let me see. Oh, my scroll is off. Yeah, it was based on the four-hour chart. So mine was um, like right in here. Um, kind of cut those wicks right, right through the middle. But what we have here then, once this, this has pulled back to um, this price pattern then, because we've had more enthusiasm for the buy side of this, this does begin to have more of a, of a um, continuation pattern feel to it. And I begin to get excited about a bounce off of this area um, to go long. The next thing I do is come down to my next time frame, a four-hour chart in my case. And I start to look for signs. What is that, that reversal going to look like? What is that, excuse me, what is that long going to look like? And um, this is a situation where I start to look for, especially on um, lo the longer term charts, something that says um, it's ready to reverse. That's, that can be a combination of candlestick patterns. Sometimes it'll um, kind of bounce along and create a little consolidation area, a smaller triangle, if you will, right? A, um, a triangulation along this line before it bounces up. In this case, we had some really nice candles. I missed um, the first entry point and had to wait for the retracement. Um, so I didn't get 
you know, my, my ideal entry there. But then, of course, the next question is, where's what's a good profit target, right? So if we can put together a plan from support and resistance levels, what are, what are we really going for? These are great trades because you get a great risk to reward. If you can grab that bounce close to that trend line, your risk can be down here. Your reward is way up here. And remember, we're not going for ultimate highs, right? It doesn't make sense because things are triangulating. Now, chances are really good because this is kind of, you know, if you're following the two-thirds rules, and this does end up being a continuation pattern. Chances are really good that this could just keep climbing through all of this. But it's a loony pair, right? It's it's an oil back pair, and it can be kind of tricky to trade. So there's no sense in digging your heels in and being stubborn with the trade. But we do have the potential of, of uh, playing out that triangle, and that would be the entire base of the triangle. If you want to be a little more conservative, you can go um, to the second um, uh, the interim movement in there, which usually falls about the 161.8. Yeah, that's pretty close, right? Okay, I digress. Let me get rid of that. We're not going to count on this as we get in down here on this, on, in equity, equities, in currencies, I don't. Um, so getting a good price point in here really means that what we start to look for then is a place where we can edge into the trade and get out of the trade, edge into the trade and get out of the trade. We want to take each individual leg and treat it as a separate trade. Oh, sorry. Um, so knowing that this is uh, the next leg of this trade has the potential to not break out of this triangle, to perhaps create... Um, a, a second uh, resistance level in here and bounce away. I don't want to go for this this highest high here. I want to find a secondary high, right? Doesn't that make more sense? And I'm going to pick a price point that sort of splits the difference between these bodies and these candles. And here that brings me to about 87.50. With a yen pair, the 50 mark is um, is just as almost sometimes more so a psychological number than the double lot. And um, 87.40 seems like a great profit target. All right, let me see what we got for questions. When price retraces to the 87 level approximately on your chart, possible FIB level, um, do you use Fibonacci in your trading? I use Fibonacci as a kind of a lazy way to um, measure my breakouts because it's easy for me to calculate 100% of my move, like I did here on the triangle. Right? If channel trading means you take 100% of the move of the triangle as it formed, the base of the triangle that formed, I can throw some fibs on there, and it's going to give me 100% of that move rather than just doing the math. I don't really use the um, the uh, the levels like a lot of people do in terms of you know waiting for it to break back and then come back to some some interim level in here. Um, I don't use them that way. It's just a simple way for me to measure. All right, good question. So coming down to, sorry, coming down to um, the one-hour chart, because I said, you know, I go from daily four hour to one hour, let's take a look at what this price action looks like on the one-hour chart. Look at what we had here as another confirmation, right? Now, um, I was actually in before this pullback because I didn't get my, um, I didn't get the breakout, you know, the, the the uh, candle uh, entry that I liked. I had to wait for a pullback. Um, I got this pullback here and got into the trade here and then slept through all of this business. Missed my stop by five pips on a yen pair. Today's my lucky day. And now it's climbing. But look at what we have here. We have also, as a confirmation of the long, the, um, the sentiment of a double bottom, right? What's the sentiment behind the price action? That the market was able to drive the price to, to that point twice. The market was able to drive that point, that the price to that point twice, um, without breaking it, without any significant momentum enough to break the, the um, habit that that resistance or support level has has held. And that's what happened here. It came down. Um, oops, come on, line. There we go. It came down to the same support. It came down to here. Look, even this was impulsive. It gapped down it with a quick, quick correction right in there. Um, came down to that level and bounced clean away from it. Now, a double top, double bottom, double 
triple top, triple bottom. Those aren't actually confirmed patterns until you get a break of the neckline. Everything's potential double bottom, potential double top, until you actually get a close above that neckline. That neckline for me is actually the bodies of these candles because it splits the difference between these wicks and these bodies over here, right? Again, support and resistance can be a little tricky in where do you ultimately pick your, your absolute price point. Um, because everything, support and resistance, is a zone. The, the money moves in such large quantities, there's, it's practically impossible to have an absolute price point. But you have to figure out what works for you, and I usually split the difference. So now what we have on this is um, a triggered double bottom We're on the one-hour chart. Patterns on the hourly chart, the only ones I trust, are um, absolute reversal patterns. Um, I don't like triangles on the one-hour chart. They are just as often reversal patterns as they are continuation patterns. And without a bias to the trade, it can be difficult to, um, to plan properly. So taking the measurement of that double bottom, I just used a quick fib up there to find my measurement. It lines up really nice support and resistance-wise. Now, ultimately, my profit target is up here, right? But in the spirit of taking each leg of the trade, is there any harm in taking profit at 85.80? It's 20 pips short of the even number. It's been support. It's been resistance. It's a likely place for things to pause and create a consolidation area or a pullback and give you another shot at the second leg of the trade. This is a very easy way to get in, grab some pips, get out. Get in, grab some pips, get out. Um, and I want you to start experimenting with kind of reading the sentiment behind price action in your backtesting and in your system development. Now let me see if there's any more questions on the loony yen before we take what we just talked about here and apply it to a four-hour chart on a pound dollar. So any terms I'm using that aren't making sense, I, the thing I like so much about support and resistance trading is that it just keeps everything super simple. Why the loony? Um, it's uh, it's the the loony is a bird and it's on um, Canadian money and so they're they're the Canadian dollar is just called the loony. Same reason why the um, New Zealand dollar is called a kiwi, um, and the uh, um, so what have we got? Now I'm trying to think. Looney, Kiwi, Aussie, well that's just Australian dollar. I think that's the only one like that. Now he's got me thinking. All right, and Jeremy's ready to go to the pound dollar, so let's go ahead and go there. We can absolutely do that. No more questions on this, huh? So uh, Jerry's clarifying, so what's my Looney Yen take profit? Right now it's in here at um, 85.80, and it's just recently been that because I was ultimately trying to go for a shorter profit target based on just this bounce way down here. But now that it's triggered this double bottom, um, I'm willing to play the double bottom as a part, as kind of an add-on to my original trade. Uh, do you plot any moving average to filter your trades? Uh, yes, I do like to have on a um, an 800 simple moving average because it acts kind of as a home base for price action when things get tired. Very often it'll come back to the 800 simple moving average. It's an easy way to um, um, kind of find a place to, to, I always call it, reset the game. Yep. And then I'll also use a MACD with just default settings to help identify any possible um, slowdown in enthusiasm. I use it as a, as a sentiment indicator. Hold on. Lena, I use that 800 simple moving average on all of them. All time frames. The question is, on which time frame do you use that 800 simple moving average? Um, I use it on all of them. I don't know if the recording has the questions on that, so um, I'll just read that one off. So let's go to the um, pound dollar. Can you explain how to set the exit or the profit target? Um, yeah, the, the profit target, the ultimate profit target, what I'm going to scale in and scale out to, up to, right? I'm not going to hold on to this trade the entire time. I'm going to add some positions, take out some profit, add some positions, take out some profit. And I've got a couple different legs I'm going to do that, right? I'm going to do that from um, now that this has been triggered, my next leg is up to 85.80, and then the one after that is up to 87.40. I want to give it time to kind of 
to um, recenter itself, figure out what it's going to do next before I jump in. Because it, all of this analysis, all of this wonderful talk we just had could be completely blown up by OPEC resetting prices on oil. You know what I mean? Like something could happen that comes in and changes the game entirely and all this technical analysis goes right out the window. So I don't want to get caught up in that. I don't want to get churned up in my trading. I want to be able to take it and dissect it in smaller parts. And the way I got to those um, profit targets, the way I got to those profit targets was um, this next leg is a 100% movement of the double bottom. And for um, currencies, you always want to take the most recent price action, which is usually shorter. Um, Going for the, the longer price action, it can be um, kind of dicey. It can come, that's, that's when you get into those. It missed my profit target by three pips and turned around, and then you're sad and you cry, and your friends don't want to be around you because you're depressing. Um, dinner parties are off, and all the fun goes away. So you don't want to do that. What you want to do then is take this 100% movement um, of the shorter, uh, most recent price action. I always move it for support and resistance. This one actually lined up pretty nicely, uh, support and resistance-wise. I didn't have to do much with it. Sometimes I'll have to chop, you know, between 10 and, and 20 pips off of my profit target to align it with support and resistance because in my mind, and in my experience, support and resistance is king. Uh, Fibonacci's are great. Elliott Wave is great. There's a ton of things that um, will get you there. Miss, you know, there's there's pivots. There's moving averages. There's this, that, and the other. But um, you'll find if you use something other than support and resistance, you really start to um, miss profit targets by little itty bitty bits and stuff. The second profit target um, issue was the um, going for on the four hour chart a secondary high. Right? If this is going to triangulate, if I'm going to get um, uh, higher lows, lower high, higher lows, and my next one is possibly a lower high. I don't want to go for that absolute high in there. So I picked this shoulder in here and split the difference between these two shoulders, um, these two little uh, climbs right in here. Hmm? That's how I found that profit target. Can you please show again the FIBO tool that shows the 100% movement calculation you're talking about? Oh, um, yeah, sure. It's, um, I'll just throw it on here again. It's just regular Fibonacci's. I've just set it with all of these um, levels that you see in here on the regular Fibonacci's. If you select it, right click, you can go to Fibo properties and add your own levels. And um, I've added it, I've just duplicated it, right? I've just put a mirror to it and mirrored that, those levels up to the top. Um, with the exception, the only difference being at my 200% level, I've got the at symbol percent sign and the dollar sign, and that will show me 200% um, at and then my price level, because really that's all that matters to me. I'm not some, you know, Fibonacci guru. I know some people really do extremely well um, using Fibonacci retracements and stuff, but um, I'm a price action girl, so <laughs> that's what I do. Good, excellent, Ashu, thank you. Wonderful, Lena. Okay, so let's move that all to the um, pound dollar then because what's going on with the pound dollar, here's our daily chart. This is the chart we usually talk about. And you can see that um, it's so stuck in this long-term consolidation area. And it looked for a while, Excuse me. It looked for a while that um, it was it was going to choose a very dollar bullish uh, side of the trade. We had new lower lows, new lower highs, but then once it hit kind of this secondary uh, support area at the bottom of this larger consolidation area, the price action really got churned up. There's lots and lots of indecision in this price action in here. It was like the market just really didn't mean to pull it down there, but they were going to sit there for long enough to figure out if it was going to be to their advantage to um, go long or short. You know, a lot of times what you'll get with that indecision is an immediate pullback, at least to old retracement levels, you know, at least to the bottom. And it didn't happen immediately. Instead, there was kind of a churning up of the price in there. What we have got, though, remember our all-important level? Why is this not labeled? Those of you who have been with me for a while, you know we've been talking about this important level, and that's all I've been calling it, really techn technical term, right? 
the price has come up to it. Actually tried to nudge above it and couldn't quite do it. And you see here, even on the daily chart, you can start to see um, we have second, we have a, a lower high here, don't we? That becomes really important. Not only are we stuck in this longer term consolidation area, we're starting to get a feel for um, some potential uh, telegraphing, right, of what the market could could be looking at in terms of its of its trade. It was pretty enthusiastic about this this drive um, downward, but immediately showed in um, indecision. Oh, do I need to reset my chart? Can you guys see the chart? Sometimes when I change charts, it chops up. I'm going to just take it off and put it on again. There we go. Now it should be better. Okay, super. All right. Um, so now what we're going to, to look at, now that we recognize that we're kind of in this all, in, we're up against, we've nudged our head up against this all-important level a couple of times, even though that price has been rejected, um, once it comes down to the bottom of this important consolidation range, it's, it really becomes hesitant. And we came up to those levels with um, a lot of enthusiasm, only to meet with, with immediate indecision. We're going to go to the four-hour chart now. Oh, let me get rid of that yellow box just so it doesn't ugly up the chart. If I can find it. Come on. Where's my corners? All right, get rid of that. Get rid of that. There we go. Okay. Now let's go to the four-hour chart. What we're looking at here, and this isn't as pretty, but I wanted to have the conversation with you because sometimes these things aren't pretty, right? Um, what we have here is kind of a similar thing going on. Now, we know we're at a very important resistance. And we know that when we come up to these levels, we get sharp re rejection. But what is also happening is when it comes down to the bottom of that consolidation, let me put that price back, that price back on there. What we get when we come to the bottom of that consolidation area is price rejection. So we've got um, gradually um, higher lows and gradually lower highs. Again, this is the triangulation we're talking about here, right? This really is not very, it's not a pretty triangle. You'll find if you start um, looking for the triangulation, the shorter time frame you go, the uglier they get. Four hours are actually usually pretty good, um, but uh, this one is, isn't, but that's okay. They're still valid. Test them, you know, test it out and see what, what you like, what looks like a good triangle to you, what's a viable signal and what's not. Now the thing that's tricky about this particular triangle is that we, even though on the four hour chart we did technically come into it from this very slight uptrend, really all we've done is come into a new consolidation area out of an old consolidation area, right? Here's one consolidation area, here's another consolidation area, and in between here we get a muddy area. Where's Boyke? Is Boyke here today? He likes it when I talk about the muddy area. Oh no, he's not. He's always giving me a hard time not using those really highly technical terms. But you can see here what I mean by muddy area. You know, there was no, no respect in here for any kind of um, support and resistance area. And this, this in-between phase kind of holds on to wicks and shadows, um, quick reversal patterns and things like that. And that's very often the case. So understanding now, now we can see kind of the difference, right? A triangle is not a triangle is not a triangle. Now we can understand that if we're, what we're lo really looking at is um, a new consolidation area that is just triangulating and really could go either way. We can still take these trades. We can still take an, a one-hour trade, a bounce off of this level, go for a secondary high, just like we did, see if we can find a good level. Well, here, let me get rid of my scroll. That looks pretty good right there. Um, go for a secondary high, right? We can still take advantage of these movements in here, but what's going to happen as we get closer and closer to what's looking like, um, oh, crud. There we go. What's looking like a, uh, a breakout. We're going to be more conservative with our money management. We're not going to put as much on the line. We're going to be more conservative with our profit target. Get in, get a few pips, get out. 
We're not going to dig our heels in about a trade. Um, putting price action in this larger context like this allows us to then kind of put um, an if this then that scenario into our trading plan and allow us to take advantage of um, any potential moves that could be coming up along the way. So what, is, what do we have for questions? How do you, how do you see the long consolidation of the Euro Swiss? Um, I don't generally trade the Euro Swiss. That's a pair that just makes me absolutely insane. Um, and when I did trade it, I only traded it on the four hour and the daily chart because um, it's all of that weird price action that just kind of nudges along slowly only made sense to me in a longer time frame. But we can look at the Euro Swiss if you'd like. Um, let me just make sure there's no other questions about um, the pound dollar. Yeah, Mike, can you believe that? And they're actually saying that they're expecting more um, more rate increases. So, um, oh, in case this doesn't show up on the on the recording, Mike says earlier today um, the Reserve Bank of Australia announced increases in bank rates by 0.25 percent. Although it was forecast, I was expecting an increase in the Aussie, but the price actually fell. Do I have any comments? Absolutely, I have comments. What happened? Um, the with the Aussie dollar. Let's go ahead and just pull up the chart. We'll take a look at it. This is part of the reason why I love support and resistance trading. Okay, um, price becomes overextended. I mean, it just really does. What happened with the Aussie dollar? We actually have a chain of events for, and I'm happy to talk about it. Oh, yeah. Let me um, refresh the chart. Thank you for letting me know. There we go. Should see it okay now. I do forget to do that. I appreciate you reminding me. Um, we have a chain of events that we can talk about with the Aussie dollar. That was actually quite remarkable, but it does help you kind of tie the ability to um, understand what's going on fundamentally and and marry that with some technicals. This is um, oh, <laughs> this is actually my other chart. You can see this purple line just to catch you up on what we're looking at here. Um, is the 800 simple moving average, and this is the MACD that I use with, with just default settings. Simple, 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 absolutely simple. I do not complicate my charts with a bunch of mucky muck. So um, what we get when things start to, to get overextended um, is that probability for the pullback. And if you've been with me for a while, you've seen me plan trades like that, where it's looking like things are just tired, they're overextended, it's time to come back home to old price action. This is a situation where um, it's done exactly that. It's coming back to old price action here along this price pattern. Overextension is overextension, and things um, when when things become too expensive for the market, if the market wants to buy those things back, they have to pull that price back to an affordable level to move those gargantuan amounts of money, right? But here was another sign in terms of marrying the fundamentals with the technicals. Here's another sign that we were not going to get the expected reaction out of the Aussie dollar forecasted interest rate hike, right? Generally, it's a no-brainer. Interest rates go up. The value of that currency goes up at least intraday, right? At least get some impulsive move. What we had uh, last month when the RBA came out and announced um, – uh, rate increases. We had the price jump really, really far, really fast, and that was that's always my first sign to start watching for correction. That's always, I start. That doesn't mean I jump in short. I'm sorry. It doesn't mean that I jump in short. It just means that I start watching for other signs of things um, that that might indicate it's ready to come back. Right after the RBA did that. There was all these these other talks from um, people in Australia, from the Australian government, almost making corrective talks. Like their currency got so expensive so fast, they came out and said, well, you know, yeah, things are looking good and we're excited to be some of the first currencies to, to or first uh, economies to, to show growth and recovery. However, we expect things to slow down. The talk was really corrective. The interesting thing was, though, Mike, is that it didn't correct the price. The price of the Aussie just kept climbing. So right there, when you've got that divergence of, you know, public sentiment and price, 
it's not divergence you see on a chart, right? But it is divergence. When you know something is A, exhausted, B, it had an impulsive move, C, is, is ready for correction, at least by um, matter of the fact that, that people are talking correctively, their, their verbiage becomes corrective and it doesn't happen, then that next big move is very often the corrective measure on that. So they increased rates, the price came back. Well, if the market wants to buy it again, if, if uh, price is going to, if the market wants to, to drive price long again, it's really got to pull that back and kind of figure out where it's at fundamentally, technically, who's buying the currency now, who's selling it, did the, did the forecast have, um, you know, what was priced in before the announcement, all of those things. And often what everybody expects to happen at the big announcement is the exact opposite. Does that make sense, Mike? Is, I know sometimes it's hard when you start talking, you know, some, I mean, I'm talking about conceptual divergence, right? It's not something you see on a chart. Good. Excellent. Wonderful. I'm, I'm glad that makes sense. And really that's, that's what kind of happened to the Kiwi as well. The Kiwi kind of did the same thing and really wrote on the coattails of the Aussie. And even though, um, you know, retail sales in New Zealand really started to slow down and there were, there was a lot of things that happened um, to correct that price and when it didn't, it just became time to pull back. I mean, just the market has to pull that price back. And um, these are things, guys, you'll learn over time. You'll, you'll kind of get that feel, that push and pull of the market. I love that you're here. I want you to stay present in your, in your trading, but not just, you know, what one professed guru says over what another professed guru is. At some point, you're going to have to start drawing your own parallels, and you're going to have to start kind of mapping out your own way. And um, these are just some things you can start looking for. They're not always obvious, um, but you start to feel them as, as you get more and more um, in tune with the market and experienced with, um, with the currency uh, relationships in the first place. Perfect point. Excellent, Eric. Plus the Kiwi and the Aussie were all the, were the big. But he says, uh, plus the Kiwi and the Aussie were all the biggest gainers against the USD, and you're absolutely right. While um, the dollar was sort of kind of maintaining this, this steady place, um, these two currencies were just beating it up. You know, at some point the dollar's got to go, hey, wait a second, it's my turn, and that's what's going on. Um, Mike says, your support trend line looks like a good price to buy. It is. Yeah, let's take a look at what that might look like, a four-hour chart. Now, remember, it may not come all the way down to that line, right? So as we move into the price action, we want to start saying, what's a good plan for this pair? Now that it's kind of corrected its, its price, what's going on with this pair? Now, I know I've got other things on the chart, but I'd rather talk to you about price sentiment. I'd rather talk to you about what's going on um, on the price alone. So what we start, need to start doing is identifying some support and resistance levels where the price is at right now. Is this close enough to this price line for this to, to, to trigger a trade anytime soon? And um, technically, I suppose the answer could be yes. And this could be a really good bounce right up off of this trend line and, um, you know, a close above the secondary high would be a really good place to go ahead and get in that. Why a close below, what, above? Why not take this um, this candlestick reversal pattern? We even have a candlestick that's that's forming a confirmation candle of this pattern. Sure, you can get in there. You're going to get a better risk to reward. But if this is doing some kind of funky triangulation in here, right, we might see this a little bit better on a one-hour chart. If this is doing some kind of um, ugly little uh, triangulation in here, it's possible that this doesn't get as high as that, um, you know, it, it could reach a third um, lower high in here, right? And you could be in a situation where you're you're holding on to a trade, well, it kind of goofs around on you until it comes closer and closer to this trend line, not by any definitive action, but by moving sideways, which is absolutely maddening if you've ever been in a situation like that. You're holding on and you go, it's just a normal consolidation, everything's fine, and you hold on, you hold on, only to see that, um, you know, the thing, darn thing just keeps going sideways on you. Moving down to the one-hour chart, we get to take a look at these levels we drew. And actually, they, they make pretty good sense. But this, this bottom one here sort of split the difference between um, 
this ultimate low and some of these bodies that got missed in here. This high, which was the secondary high to this high, right, um, seems like a good place to trigger a trade. And you start to look at this as the area that you're willing to make decisions on. Hmm? Do you see that? We're also on the 800 simple moving average. Ashu asked, how does that 800 simple moving average work? And I told you that it acts as kind of a home base for the pairs um, when things get really overextended. Very often, they'll come all the way back to the 800 simple moving average. When they do, price will kind of churn there for a little while, which you know goes with the same analysis, right? If this is going to triangulate in here. So the, the 800 is, you know, it's it's kind of a, um, it's nice to have on the chart, but you don't need it if you understand price action. And you wait for that to kind of finish its, its goofing around. A close below that, that uh, trend line could mean that this is ready to go short. Um, if you get a close below this trend line, and I'm talking about down the line, right? If this triangulates enough that it comes over to this trend line and then breaks below it, you don't want to get chopped up in a similar churn. You want to look for a horizontal support resistance level. That makes sense. Um, so I'm going to grab this one over here that is uh, support here and resistance here. Um, and then we've got, oh, actually, this, this one's better anyway. Yeah, so if this triangulates along here, a close below this horizontal level and below that trend line would be a great signal to go short. If it triangulates along in here and closes it back above here, then maybe this isn't completely tired and we have a little more oomph to the long side. You can take 100% of that the channel that you've chosen. It should line up somewhere near a secondary high, and it does. If you wanted to be a little more aggressive, you could actually go for those shoulders up here. Um, but I actually like to be a little more conservative in my profit taking. I like money in the bank, right? So I'll take my money and go home. So that looks like a pretty reasonable trade. I went through that one pretty quickly because we're running out of time here. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, let's see. Um, Eric says it just crossed 800 in the five minute for a better entry. Okay. Does it concern you that it's near the 800? Um, on the one hour chart, it's actually consolidating around the 800. And that's a good sign for me. It's going to, um, usually, it's, it's really rare that things will just go screaming through the 800 simple moving average. They'll usually consolidate there for a little bit. Um, and give you chance, give you a chance to make a plan for the trade. I actually don't trade the Aussie dollar. It's not my favorite pair. I don't love it. Um, but we talk about it in my watch list webinars and stuff that I do with my students. Um, yes, you're absolutely welcome. Can we see the Kiwi dollar? Um, very similar to this one, and we're running out of time. Hi, AB. <laughs> if you have specific questions, AB, I answered a, a post about um, a long Kiwi trade I just entered. Mike says, do you also trade equities, indices, bonds, or mainly trade equities? I, I'm an FX trader now. I won't, I, I won't ever go back to equities. Nope, nope, nope. I love FX. <laughs> do you analyze the U.S. dollar index when you do your planning for trades for the week? No, I don't. It's something I keep in mind. Um, if I come across information about it, or um, even the VIX, right, you know, as a volatility indicator, can be kind of helpful. But um, I find that analyzing overall dollar weakness or strength kind of muddies the waters when I bring my analysis to an individual pair. Uh, what are my favorite pairs? Uh, I love the Kiwi, the Pound Dollar, the Pound Yen. Uh, the Looney Yen, for being a Looney pair, is actually really quite um, predictable. Um, I don't know, Amy, have you ever counted the number of pairs I have on my watch list? I don't know. Maybe wants to know why I hold the long view on the on the uh, Kiwi. Same reason why I ha have it on the Aussie. It's uh, come down to trend line and is looking for a bounce. It's kind of stuck right now in this uh, in this muddy area in here, so I'm in a little bit early. Um, but yeah, looking for that bounce there, especially after such a strong um, impulsive move in here. You can see how this this downside of this trade was so much more convicted than that of the um, Aussie. Um, yeah, 12 ish. Yeah, so I have about a dozen pairs on my watch list. And, um, oh, thank you. Um, 
and those aren't necessarily pairs that I, I trade directly. It's it's really rare. I'm actually short the, the dollar loonie right now, but it's actually really rare that I'll take um, a dollar loonie or dollar Swiss trade directly. But I want to watch them because they're going to help me um, analyze potential movement on the crosses, right? So on an active pair like the um, pound dollar or the euro dollar, how many trades on average do you get in um, on one week using the one hour time frame? Um, Gosh, on each pair, not many, one or two. I really don't trade. I don't trade a whole lot. I think in, you know, probably on average I'll take between four and six trades. But I stop trading on Wednesday. I don't trade Thursdays and Fridays. So, um, yeah, I'm just better early on in the week. I don't know if it's because I'm more, you know, <laughs> well-rested from the weekend or I don't know why that is. but. Um, yeah, um, Jesus, because I'm, I just, my Thursday, when going back over my trade logs over the years, and you know, I'll, I've done this, if you, if you keep good track of your trades, take screenshots, take good notes of your trades, you know where you're at, um, then you can always at the end of the week or at the end of the month, I'm kind of at the point now where I do it every couple months, but if you go back and you look at where you've been, where you're, you are your best trader, um, why not take out the days you're not that good? And most of my wins are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So t I take Thursday and Friday off. It's just what I do. Um, yeah, Thursday is still a good day. And there's plenty of people that make money on Thursday. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not saying you shouldn't trade on Thursday. I'm just saying I don't. I'm just much better in the earlier part of the week. Do I ever trade NFP? No. Uh-uh. No, no, I don't. But I'm not a scalper, Mike. I don't go in for the really short-term time frames. I'm just not good at it. I'm much better in the longer-term time frames. I can read price action better in the longer term. And uh, the shorter term, it seems, you know, to, to look at price through my eyes and my understanding and my frame of reference for price action, um, you know, looking for that next confirmation candle or, or that waiting for a close above or that breakout or whatever, I find that I miss the bulk of the move and I can't get a good risk to reward and that's just me. I'm not saying people can't be good short term. I'm just saying that's where I'm at. And those of you who have been with me for a while, you know that I talk about that constantly. I mean, it's not about learning how to trade like me. I hope I really hope you're not here to learn how to trade like I trade. I want to give you some tools, I want to teach you some things about price action, but really what your job is if you want to trade for a living is you have to find out the best way for you to trade for you. What kind of things do you like? You know, when you use um, trend lines, do you like to cut off the wicks or include them? When you um, take a breakout trade, do you like a close or do you like a bounce? I mean, these are all things that you have to define for yourself. Do you like the longer term time frame, the shorter term time frame? Um, that's what becomes super, super important because if you're trying to trade like somebody else, you're going to struggle with this um, for as long as you decide to struggle with it. Anise says, I find all uh, successful traders trading only three days. Yeah, well, you know, and a part of it is, too, when you've made your money, why put it back out there, right? Enjoy some time. Aren't we learning to trade to give ourselves some freedom in our life so that we can have those days to go work at the kids' at school and to be active in our community or maybe just treat ourselves well and go golfing or, you know, the whole reason we're doing this is, is to lead a different life than I have to trade this, that, and the other day. Yeah, absolutely. How do you track every trade? Pen and paper. Yep, I just write it down. Do you trade a particular um, session or do you just get up to your screen and based on price alerts? Set? Yeah, I, I, I always have a plan ahead of time. I've got a watch list that I put out. Um, and when that triggers, I'll trade it. Yeah. Now, if you're a really short-term trader, you're going to want to find a high volume um, trading session. If you do, you know, even probably up to 15, maybe even 30 minute trades, you might want to find, you know, the overlap of the Asian or the um, European and the New York or something like that. But I'll take them when they trigger. Amy says, I figured if I'm not good on Thursday and I get in a bad trade, two negatives will make a positive. <laughs> oh, you're funny. No, nope, doesn't work like that. Uh, William, I'm in Colorado in the United States. How relevant are candlestick signals um, in view of support and resistance? Very relevant, especially longer term. 
especially longer term. I use them a lot. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily even as a trigger, but um, certainly in terms of recognizing the sentiment behind what's going on with the market. Yes, yeah. oh, thank you, Jesus. Family is most important. That's why I do this. Yep, absolutely. All right, and we are nearing that time. I need to get going. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm so glad to see you here. Adinda, Maud, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for going through the extra trouble to record this and everything. I'll be here next Tuesday, um, same time, same channel, and you guys have a great rest of your week. Be good to yourselves. Bye-bye.